All right, we have two o'clock in the afternoon central time. We're going to get started here. Good afternoon and welcome to the Destination Medical Center 2020 Assistive Tech Challenge. We are so pleased you're here to join us today. It's a virtual competition, but uh, not the way we had planned it, but that's what we have. And we're so glad you've been able to join us. This is a business pitch competition. My name is Chris Shad. I am the Director of Business Development for Destination Medical Center's Discovery Square, and I'm going to be your host for today's pitch competition. Uh, before we get started, I have Lisa Clark here. She's the Executive Director of the DMC Economic Development Agency. She has a few words of welcome she wants to share with you. Lisa? Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted for DMC to be sponsoring and hosting this pitch competition. Of course, we'd prefer to see all of you live and in person, but it's not going to happen, and these circumstances permit, don't permit that. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't stop us, and it doesn't diminish the value of this important event. There are many pitch competitions across the nation. We all know that. But what we've learned is that very few of them really focus on uh, creating technology to assist individuals with disabilities. I wanna say a special thanks to Chris and to the DMC team for staying the course on this one. I wanna say a special uh, thanks also to our judges and of course to our um, people that are gonna be doing their pitches. Uh, thank you so much for all of the teams. You are very inspiring. It's innovation and forward thinking like this that's gonna take us forward to recovery and resiliency in the world of business. Uh, so thank you for that. The competition puts us in a spotlight. It puts Minnesota in a spotlight and it puts this region in a spotlight related to innovation and entrepreneurship. Also a thank you to our sponsors. And with that, I wish everyone good luck. I wanna thank everyone for being here today and enjoy the competition. Thank you, Lisa. All right, uh, before we jump into the pitches and we are going to in just a minute, we wanna know where you all are from. Uh, my colleague Aaron is going to put up a poll here. And for those of you who are connected in through the Zoom platform, uh, the poll will come up. Tell us where you are connecting from for today's event. And uh, are you coming from Rochester, Minnesota area? Are you coming from Minnesota, but outside of Rochester? Are you in a state immediately adjacent to Minnesota? Or are you coming from somewhere else? We've done a few of these sessions over the last a uh, few weeks and it's been great fun to see people connecting in from all around the country which is something that uh, given the circumstances we're able to do we'd rather not be able to do it that way but this is the world that we live in right now just take a moment and tell us where you're coming from if you're on the facebook feed uh, you won't be able to vote unfortunately but please do comment in um, on this live feed. All right, let's see where you all are from. It looks like most of you are from somewhere else, that magical place called somewhere else, uh, outside of Minnesota and outside the upper Midwest, 41% of you, that's great. Aaron, thank you. Let's. Um, Let's jump in. Today we have 10 teams pitching their assistive technology ideas to help people with disabilities. There are two divisions. We have an open division, which is consisting of either students or community-based teams. And we have a professional division, which are companies that have formed and uh, they have annual revenues of less than $200,000. We have six teams today that are competing in the open division and four teams competing in the professional division. What are they competing for? They're competing for bragging rights and cash. At stake, first place in each division will win $5,000 and second place in each division will win $2,500. For those of you in the audience uh, on the Zoom session, you get to, as a bonus, select the winner of the People's Choice Award, which is worth another $500 to the winning team. So we will have a first and second place winner in each of the two divisions among those teams. And then there will be one People's Choice Award voted on by the audience, you the audience, when you've heard all 10 of the pitches. And so be taking notes as we go 
through that. That all is made possible by our sponsors and I do want to acknowledge the sponsors of our event today. They have been tremendously helpful and uh, supportive of us as an organization. Special thanks go to Advanced Tech and Biosig Technologies, Colliers International, Fredrickson and Byron, Home Federal, the Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation, St. Mary's University of Minnesota, Kabari Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies, Rochester Home Infusion, Maxibility, and Mayo Clinic Department of Business Development. Thank you sponsors for making this happen. So we have teams, we have prizes, we have sponsors, and we have judges. So let's take a minute to get to meet our judges. We have a crack team of professionals. They have what is hopefully a really hard task of identifying who the winners are. And our judges for today, we have Jessica Berg, who is the director of the Minnesota Cup. She is one of our judges. We have Dave Andrews. He's an engineering supervisor at the Minnesota, Minnesota State Services for the Blind. We have Nathan Wiedemann, who is the director of the Office of Translation to Practice at Mayo Clinic. Lena pradam nabzik she is the founder of Konomics, a technology company that is now in Rochester, Minnesota. And John Doan, who is co-founder and CEO of Mobility for All. Mobility for All was one of our winners in the first Assistive Tech Challenge back in 2018. So judges, thank you for uh, being here today. I hope you have a really hard job today of picking a winner. All right, so let's get started. In the open division, this is a timed competition. Each team has three minutes to make their pitch, and then they have two minutes of Q&A time with the judges. So we're gonna ask all of the teams that are not pitching to turn off their cameras and turn off their microphones, and first up in the open division will be Calm Connect. And in the on deck circle will be BMW Gate. A reminder for our audience, please remember to take notes um, because you will be voting for our People's Choice Award. Calm Connect, are you there and ready to go? Yes. All right, you have the stage. Okay, hi, I'm Kaylee Landers and I'm here with Isabel Betteg and we are the founders of Calm Connect. Calm Connect brings calming pictures into what could be a stressful environment through the use of an app-enabled projector. Next slide. Last year, my sister was in the hospital getting chemo treatments. The only thing she wanted was to be at home. Isabel and I were brainstorming ideas and recognized the value of comforting familiar images in my sister's healing process. One of the many reasons we think our product can be a success is our personal connection and that we have a university supporting us as well as the Kabara Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies, which provides us with resources as well as two professors who have experience and knowledge in entrepreneurship and technology. Next slide. On average, 3 million people are admitted to the hospital every year and separated from the entirety of their home-based support system. In many cases, patients experience limited mobility and often find themselves staring at the ceiling. A study done by Clemson found that hospital patients who viewed calming images during their hospital stays showed significantly fewer signs of pain. Patients who viewed only a black screen reported significantly higher levels. Another study by BYU demonstrated a link between loneliness and increased health issues. Calm Connect addresses the issue of loneliness and value of comforting images answering the needs identified through these studies. I'll hand it off to Isabel to explain how our product works. Next slide. Thank you, Kaylee. My name is Isabel, and I'm going to explain a little bit about the two elements involved in our products, both the projector and the app. We are using the app to create a curated library to project tailored content for patients. Next slide. Our app involves preset themes and pictures, as well as media that can be uploaded by a patient's loved ones. The patient can connect their phone to the projector, which clips onto the side of their bed. The content from the app is then projected onto the ceiling, where patients can view the various messages from friends and family. Next slide. As we enter into the app development stage, this is what we envision. The app will have two main screens. One view will be from the patient's perspective, and the other from the patient's social support system, which includes family and friends. The patient support system screen will have several key buttons, such as upload a video, send an audio message, or even take a picture. The patient's view will have various buttons, including share your pin, schedule content viewings, and view new content. Next slide. Some of our future goals are to raise capital, submit a patent, and develop a marketable prototype. 
Once we have a prototype, we want to demo our product at local hospitals. We can collect data from these trial runs and use it to expand into other environments. We do recognize that we originally made this for hospital settings, although we do see that there are many sectors that are a viable option for our product, especially environments with children. Next slide. Thank you for the opportunity to present and we look forward to your questions. Very good, thank you. That's uh, Calm Connect. Judges, you have the microphones. John, Nathan, Jessica, hey, this is Lena. This is Nathan Wiedemann. Um, what specifically do you plan to do should you win the prize money? What are you gonna use that for? So we plan on using that to develop our app and the app is a very integral part of our company and that's what makes it so special from just connecting your phone to a projector and putting it on the ceiling. The app allows other family members to actually access and then you can schedule content viewing. So we really find a need for this app to get up and running and we do find that as part of a, a major part of the money. Have you had conversations with hospitals? I, I appreciate that you mentioned that you would target a number of different people who'd actually purchase the product, whether that was individual families or if the hospitals would just keep them on, on hand. But um, do you have a sense of how they, they might value a product like this? Um, so not yet. We are in the infant stage, so we've been talking about it. Um, our goal is to hopefully get it in, well, close to St. Mary's is Winona Health, so hopefully start with a small hospital, um, test it out there, see how the patients react to it, um, feedback from that. We haven't for sure gotten into hospital yet, but we're working on that. Hopefully by the end of the year, we have a prototype to do that. Um, this is Lena. Hi, um, nice presentation. Um, how is this different from any other um, computer-based app or, you know, I have seen this in hospitals where they on the loop. You know, not necessarily personal pictures, but any kind of pictures. I've seen screens in hospital rooms already. So how would this be different? So a major key piece is not only does the projector project onto the ceiling. So in my case, my dad um, was in a neck brace in the hospitals for several months. So he wasn't able to look at the TV or see anything else. And my mom was at home with us. Uh, so it was hard for her to get back and forth to the hospital. So what she could actually do from her phone is schedule content viewing. So he couldn't reach his phone. He couldn't view Facebook. Uh, so the one thing that makes it nice is that there's going to be key features such as schedule uh, a content viewing. And even for children, when their parents are at work, they don't normally have a phone on hand with them. And the staff is supposed to keep them um, entertained. But this will allow them to be able to reach the kids from another location when they're trying to work to be able to support them at the same time. Great. Thank you. That's Calm Connect. We're out of time for the Q&A. Nice job. We're going to move on to the next one. Up next is BMW Gate. And on deck after that is Freedom Futures. So BMW Gate, are you here? Yes. There you are. Can you, you hear me? This? Yes, we can hear you. You have the stage. Hi, my name is Wagner Souza and I'm a clinician representing the BMW Gate and I'll talk to you about a smart rollator walker. Next slide. By the end of this presentation, 16 people will be severely hurt in the United States. One of them will be dead. To avoid such increasing rate of falls, 4.5 million people in the United States rely on the assistance of walkers, and they are usually very effective. However, they fail to prevent over 10,000 falls every year, which lead up to hospitalization. Next slide. That is, uh, the reason for that is mainly that high-risk falls usually occur sideways and backwards, and most walkers available in the market are front walkers that offer no support on the back and heavily rely on optimal body, uh, for, uh, body abilities, such as fast reaction times and dual test control, which are lacking in clinical populations. Next slide. To try to alleviate the situation, we propose a rear walker with a 360 degree of protection that has been designed considering the affordance of clinical populations. It is a very informative device that combines sensors to feed auditory feedback and alarms for better gate performance that is tracked on an application running on the smartphone. Next. In terms of market, considering the average price of a walker, we have 4.5 million users in the US alone to a total of $900 million. If you consider the niche market of 10,000 followers a year, that is $2 million. Next. 
Our business model plans that in the first years we'll reach 5% of the 10,000 followers a year and 0.1% of the regular users to a total of 5,000 units of our product sold at a price of $799 for a revenue of $4 million. Next. We aim to do so with a hybrid model combining business to business approach and business to customer approach based on online sales. Next. Our competitive advantages are many as we are the only walkers with uh, automatic brakes and that offers behavior tracking, gate behavior tracking. Next, that has been all put together by an interprofessional team that involves an engineer, a clinician, and a scientist working together for an holistic approach of users, their needs, and solutions. Next, together, we have already put a lot of uh, steps forward, and now we need to focus on the patent filing, prototype manufacturing, and the real research. We hope that you will help us to help people by granting us the award of this competition. Thank you. Next. Very good. Thank you. All right, judges, you are back on. What Hi. questions do you have for the team? Hi, um, nice presentation again. Um, this is Lena, and uh, my question is about any kind of FDA approval. Do you have a plan? Or have you thought about that already? It is a class uh, one device, so it doesn't really need to go through a, a very robust uh, uh, approval protocol. And it's usually purchased uh, in a more consumer approach. So these types of devices are acquired on Amazon and open platforms such as. So it shouldn't be uh, any problem uh, to get the certification. This is John. Uh, yes, great presentation. Uh, Wagner, do you have experience uh, and connections with uh, supply chain and the manufacturing of such devices? And how would you go to market with it? You mentioned a B2B and a B2C. Could you clarify yes. how that would work? Uh I have some uh, experience because I am a clinician myself and I have to prescribe my patients with those devices. And sometimes like I have to communicate with those suppliers. And in terms of business to business, it usually happens so that the company will address uh, this, the seller directly. They have a representative and they have some portfolio that they will leave at the store or one device. And then th those people will communicate with the companies like, so it's a company to company, business to business. In terms of uh, business to customer, the customer can access, the customer can access the the website or go di directly to the store and they can purchase themselves. Because although these devices usually prescribed, people have the freedom to choose the one that pleases the most. Um, could you talk a little bit about the price difference between the type of walker that's on the market currently? I can imagine that this is a population that's pretty price sensitive. So. Yes, absolutely. Although it's very price sensitive, it's a great question because the average price of a walker in the United States is $200. However, there are some walkers that go over $1,000. And a very important thing to remark is that usually people who rely on walkers, they have at least two devices up to five. So people are used to buying many more and we already consider the budget, even if you buy the low, low end device, buying five of them adds up to $1,000, which is more pricey than ours. Very good. All right. Thank you, team. We're out of time. We're going to move on. Nice job, everybody. Uh, next up is Freedom Futures. And on deck after them will be on-demand caregiver platform. So Freedom Futures, are you ready to go? We are. All right. You have the calm. Thanks, Chris. Hi. I am Sean Williams, and I am a uh, Partnered with uh, Bradley Ellenboss for a product Next slide. So the problem that we saw looking at assistive tech was that a lot of uh, devices are very limited in their use, uh, as well as difficult to learn for the users. And uh, a big part of that is the fact that this technology is rooted in solutions that were created in the 20th century. Next slide, please. So that's where we took the approach of using augmented reality to assistive tech and bringing assistive tech into the future. So uh, what uh, augmented reality is, is uh, unlike actual reality where the user is cut off from the real world with augmented reality, uh, the goggles are transparent so you can see through it. Next slide, please. The two examples I use are uh, the first in 10 line when you're watching football 
or the holographic chess in Star Wars, you can still see the real world. Uh, it's just a digital projection on top of the real world. Next slide, please. So with augmented reality, using existing uh, headsets by other manufacturers, we're creating an interface that is both intuitive, quick and easy to learn, and uh, applicable to any of the headset manufacturers that are out there today. Uh, next slide, please. And what we are building is an IoT or Internet of Things software suite, some proprietary hardware, and something we're calling reverse echolocation. Next slide, please. So this concept art shows uh, the broader use of Freedom Futures. You can control uh, lights using just your eyes, uh, control a thermostat in your house, the television, and uh, as well as motorized wheelchairs. Next slide, please. So for uh, the Assistive Check Challenge, we created a proof of concept um, for a motorized wheelchair where you can control the wheelchair's movement completely with your eyes, uh, the upper right-hand corner, uh, the demonstration of the user interface going forward, left, right, or backward. Next slide, please. And the great thing with this is that it's uh, easy to use for all users, including those with permanent disabilities, temporary disabilities, or hospitalizations, as well as long-term uh, facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm Sean Williams. I've been empowering uh, creators in all my uh, career in different fields, and Bradley's uh, background is in both mechanical engineering uh, IoT and augmented reality. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, we are looking for funding, uh, leads on technical assistance or legal assistance, either with regulations and or IP. Next slide. And that's Freedom Futures. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Freedom Futures. Judges, you can come back to the screen. And uh, what questions do you have for the team? Sean. AR is super, uh, you know, popular right now, and there's a lot of uh, runs at it from different companies. How are you seeing this as different? And then, also from a cost perspective, what would you, how would you structure your pricing? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, as far as our angle at it, um, Bradley and I really bonded over the connection between AR and IoT. Um, a lot of people are, you know, using AR just as like a, a entertainment gimmick, uh, you know, nothing you can really interact with in the real world. And that's where being able to tap into IoT and then our uh, proprietary hardware, you know, to actually control the real world using um, the digital world um, really kind of sets us apart. And then what was the second question? I'm sorry. Uh, it was price point. So how would you oh, price, price point. this? Yeah. So um, like sip and puff systems um, can get expensive, especially when you combine uh, motorized wheel con wheelchair controls with cursor controls. And so uh, for the software solution that we'd be creating, it would be subscription based, but then hardware would be, you know, acquired separately. Um, with Apple, uh, they're coming out with, you know, a cheap headset in the next couple of years. Magic Leap itself is, is kind of on the pricey side, but it's also the most consumer friendly side at this point. I have a quick question about um, your primary use case or sort of the, the particular audience or um, group that you would focus on first as you're developing this or yeah. um, could you talk a little bit more about that because I, I understand there's a huge range of applications. Yeah, so we would focus primarily on uh, quadriplegics um, specifically because by using eye tracking you can um, access you know, uh, a lot more using IoT and tapping into existing um, SDKs and APIs um, that those hardware manufacturers are using. And, um, you know, obviously our wheelchair as well. So. Very good. Thank you. Um, that's time on that one. Thank you, uh, Freedom Futures. All right, next up is on demand caregiver platform. And on deck will be AFK Pedal Adapter On Demand Caregiver Platform. Are you here and ready to go? Yes, I am. All right, you have the stage. All right, uh, hi, I'm Matt Medich, and I'm here to talk to you today about Care at Home On Demand. Next slide, please. We enter and leave this world needing care. It's a universal part of being human. And when I generally think about uh, uh, 
long-term care, I think about my Aunt Kath. Uh, 10 years ago, she'd been working a uh, very promising career at Cargill. And uh, when it became apparent that my uh, grandma was going to need uh, someone to take care of her, uh, she chose to retire early to take care of my grandma. Um, and she chose to sacrifice her plans for you know what, what has become the last 10 years to be able to take care of her. And she did this because she loved her, loved her. And this is a sacrifice that um, many millions of people around the world are, are facing right now. Um, next slide, please. So when we when we were presented with the uh, the, the tech challenge, um, we kind of focused on on the caregiver aspect, and we kind of looked at the industry for caregivers and focused it on three main problems. First being that the need is increasing every single day. Uh, a 2017 AARP uh, study estimated that 10,000 baby boomers or people of that generation um, on a daily basis are turning 65 years uh, of age. Um, and this will continue for the next 10 years. Um, this shows a uh, massive increase in the demand and a relative uh, supply um, uh, issue uh, coming up. Uh, next is that we also focus, we notice that consumers don't really know how to access that care. Do they choose a nursing home? Do they choose in-home care aid? Do they use uh, assisted living? How do they get those things? Um, these were questions that when we did surveys that, that people had, were having. Uh, also, current options are very expensive. Uh, nursing homes generally cost about uh, $70,000 per year. And when you compare this to an average $18 an hour for a caregiver, uh, the, the caregiver option seems more appealing. Um, so we, we, we looked at, okay, how can we do this better, more efficient and less sacrifice? Next slide, please. We focused it on a, uh, uh, the caregiver platform for a kind of gig economy, similar to that of like Uber, um, where our platform would connect users to caregivers in a sense where users would provide us with the, their request for what they needed as well as their budget. And then we would immediately be able to provide them with a listing of caregivers that would meet that, their needs um, and would be able to meet them at their schedule. And if that caregiver was sick one day, we would have a next one on the spot for them. Next slide, please. So to do all this, we needed a great team and our team, I believe that we've, we've uh, formed a great team. Um, we have a very wide range of uh, experiences from uh, software development to business, as well as social innovation. Next slide, please. Going next, uh, we will be to test these, uh, test our processes uh, with patients. Um, we will eventually have it as an app, but uh, for the current time, we can still test all of this on paper um, to save money and provide patients uh, with care in the meantime. Uh, last slide. Uh, and I'll, I'd like to open up for any questions. Very good. Thank you very much. That's on demand. Caregiver platform judges. Um, you can come back on. Hi. Uh, nice presentation again. Uh, my question is, so how is this different from the existing services that are out there? Um, I didn't quite get that. Why is it different than the, you know, the home health services, for example? So the home health services, um, mainly are focused on it in a, uh, um, a general area. So like I, I'm, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin right now, there's generally ones for Madison, Wisconsin. There isn't kind of a, the, the processes are, are very generalized, but they're, the amount of people where that uh, service is provided is generally a niche area for you know Madison or Minneapolis or that city or that, that surrounding area. And this would be more for um, taking those processes and bring it on a larger scale for uh, where anyone in, whether you're in Green Bay or wherever can uh, sign up for. Do you provide any kind of vetting of care providers or any kind of assurance that you're not getting some creep in your house? Yep, so uh, every uh, um, care provider would undergo a background check as well as uh, essential vetting of their credentials to make sure that what they say they have, they actually do have. I've got a question. Uh, related to existing services, have you done a competitive analysis to see what other uh, options are out there for folks, whether it's at a local or even at the national level? We have. Um, so one of the, big, the biggest ones that people know is care.com. Um, their approach generally is they provide a listing of care providers and then the users then have to go through and pick their one. They have to interview each, these, each of these people. And it's, if 
say that per, that caregiver becomes sick or you know chooses not to work with them anymore, they have to re-go through that entire process where we're looking at it more in terms of we're providing one on demand where, where you need it for this time and you will have one for that time. Very good. And speaking of time, we're out of time. So thank you. That's on demand caregiver platform. We will move on to the next one. Uh, AFK pedal adapter is next. And on deck is our final team in the open division recruitable IDD development employment, sorry. AFK pedal adapter, you're here. Yes. All uh, right, so, off you go. All right, so I'm Dylan and I'm here with my partner Whitney and we are AFK adapters. Next slide, please. So who has played a video game before? I'm gonna guess most of you have. Um, now, how would you play that video game if you only had one hand? It would be difficult, right? Next slide, please. This is a problem faced by many gamers. The Able Gamers charity estimates that there are 33 million gamers with disabilities in the United States. Among this demographic are people with partial hand amputations, limb amputations, stroke patients, and people with nerve sensitivities. Current solutions are suboptimal to say the least. Most fail to address the needs of the, those suffering from upper limb impairment, and those that do are exorbitantly priced. Some gamers that we surveyed even went as far to call it predatory. In fact, only 55% of the gamers with disabilities that we surveyed had even attempted to use peripherals. Many instead remedy this problem by simply limiting the types of games they play or by creating their own set gaming setup, some of which you can see on the screen right here. Next slide, please. This is where we come in. We've designed a foot-based video game peripheral, the AFK pedal adapter, shown on the left of the slide, that will supplement conventional video game controls. It makes the AFK pedal adapter stand out from existing solutions is that the design is twofold. First, it features four programmable buttons, which can be placed in a variety of positions on the board. This enables the user to easily customize their setup. Secondly, it can emulate a mouse or an analog stick. This feature can be operated with the foot by sliding the board along the ramp surface. However, the real advantage of this peripheral is that the button and mouse functions can be operated simultaneously and independently. This gives the user the ability to control more video game functions with their foot broadening the types of games they can play, as well as improving their ability to play competitively. Next slide. So, why us? We are passionate about accessibility in gaming, and we believe that is a hobby that everyone should be able to enjoy, regardless of disability. In addition, as biomedical engineers, we have the training, skills, and experience required to fully realize this design. We also have experience working together on previous projects, some of which relate to accessibility. Next slide. To further realize this product, our next steps are to conduct testing of our prototype among gamers with disabilities and continue conducting market research. We seek to truly understand the specific challenges that are faced by these gamers. Then we can move on to manufacturing a more refined prototype. However, more immediately, we plan to use any funds obtained to manufacture our minimum viable product in order to use in further market research. Next slide. Oh, lastly, we want to end with a statement from one of the gamers with disabilities that we surveyed. It's a challenge, but it's worth enduring, which is something we believe at AFK Adapters. Thank you. All right, thank you, AFK Adapters. Judges, you have the stage. I, I can ask. So why do you think uh, Xbox and um, uh, PS4, uh, Sony and Microsoft haven't come up with um, a solution for this problem and they have the biggest market? So Microsoft does have a product, um, the um, Xbox Adaptive Controller, that allows um, gamers with disabilities to put up, um, like, it's like a box, and then you can plug in different buttons and program it. However, a lot of the gamers that we talked to were unsatisfied with it, because it's $100 just for the box, and then the attachments you could put on it are also extremely expensive. It could be $60 just for a button. And so, and Microsoft's the only one that has taken a look at it. Nintendo and Sony have both not really done anything for it. It's just kind of a problem that's been ignored so up to now. I understand that that the disability market is pretty big, but are, are there that many people who have, you know, use of their feet, but not use of their limbs, upper limbs? Yes, actually, um, every year in the United States, uh, 17,000 partial hand amputations are performed and 185,000 upper or lower limb amputations are also performed. And uh, 
stroke victims that we've talked to mentioned that they have one arm and one leg they can use and they use like a joystick and they would like to use something with their foot. Uh, have you tested this device? Uh, my sense is that uh, there's a lot more nimbleness in your fingers and reaction times and your feet are maybe a little bit more clunky. Um, can you respond to that? So a component of this design is that we're attempting to decouple the movement from your ankle and your knee joint so you're able to control multiple things. Um, we do recognize that it's much harder to hit and maneuver things with your foot, but that's um, a big part of why one of our goals with this is to make it so you can reposition the buttons in different locations depending on what is easiest for you or even just limit it to fewer. Very good. Thank you. That is AFK pedal adapter. All right. We are really whipping through the list of presentations here. We're on our last one now in the open division. And this is recruitable IDD employment. When they're complete, when they're done, we're going to take a short little break, a bio break, and then we will come back for the professional division. Um, but recruitable IDD employment, you are up. Hi. All right. Hi, I'm Anna Substad, and today I'm here with my brother, Ben Hernis, and we're so thankful for this opportunity to share about Recruitable, which is a different type of job board specifically made for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Both Ben and I have experienced the joy of knowing and loving individuals with IDD, most directly through our aunt, Ruth, who has Down syndrome. We discovered with our aunt and many others with IDD that finding meaningful work can be difficult, so first, we're going to tell you about the disconnect both employees and employers face in our society. Next slide, please. Ben and I saw firsthand how Ruth's paper resume was no match to her infectious joy and ability to connect with people. Many others in similar situations face difficulties like unconscious bias from employers, ineffective portrayals of themselves in traditional resumes, and the discomfort and risk of disclosing disabilities. Employers, even those who are actively seeking inclusion, still lack the resources and information they need to access this talented labor pool and can even be legally restricted from asking applicants about their disabilities. Next slide, please. So to bridge this gap and solve the market deficiency, we made Recruitable, a job platform designed to connect people with disabilities to jobs that fit their unique skill sets. Next slide again, please. Our new job board allows individuals with IDD to create a profile tailored towards the skills and personalities of people with disabilities. And instead of a lacking paper resume, it presents the whole person through video interviews and photos or videos of the candidate working, questions including interests, strengths, and superpowers, and references or recommendations if they choose to include. And we've also learned from self-advocates that the site should be accessible for people who are visually impaired and be simple to use with instructional videos and pictures for job candidates. Next slide, please. Aside from an excited college student and pediatric nurse, Ben and I are delighted to have the experience and backing of our advisors. This invaluable team has robust experience with and passion for individuals with IDD, particularly in an all abilities hiring initiative, workforce reentry, Bethel University's BUILD program, and the ARC Minnesota. Together, we have the technical skills to build and maintain the site, the ability to ensure the longevity and connections to make it successful through ARC Minnesota's relationship with inclusive culture companies like Mayo and UHG. Next slide, please. The most important part of our project has been and will always be the people. So the first step in moving forward will be engagement with our talent pool. Next, we need funding to purchase and maintain our proof of concept. And we'll then need seed funds to market to small, medium, and large employers starting in the Twin Cities and Rochester. And with the help of these funds, we'll next, next launch a pilot effort with Bethel Build and ARC Minnesota, and then further delve into product development. As a self-sustaining site, we truly believe that this project will be a win-win-win for inclusive employers, employees with IDD, and organizations who strive to find meaningful work for those with IDD. Thank you very much for this time. Uh, now we can advance to the next slide and open it up for questions. Very good. That's Recruitable IDD Employment Judges. What questions do you have for the team? Ben and Anna, um, are there similar uh, platforms out there, job boards? Uh, what about nonprofits like ARC? Have, have they done something similar in the past that you might be able to build on top of? Yeah, so in our partnership with ARC, they're actually looking for something like this, but don't have anything in place right now. 
Um, and there are lots of job boards out there, but they're broad and often ineffective, especially for those with IDD um, and often use things like job scraping from other boards, have out of date listing and um, recruitable is really focused on um, accessible and community oriented job boards that allows individuals and families with IDD to effectively navigate the site and more quickly find success. I have a question also, um, do you have any sense of the timing sort of roadmap or, roadmap or complexity for developing a site of this complexity? Um, I'm just thinking about you, you reference LinkedIn as, as a corollary or something that you would try to match some of the features while also serving this community specifically and that I just can imagine that won't require a lot of tech. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, now's a great time to start a project like this. There's lots of job board um, platforms like um, Smart Job Board is what we've gone through already. We have a 14-day trial with actually a live site. And there's lots of others like that. So we don't have to start from the ground up coding a website like with JavaScript, although we can build on to other sites to add features um, to, to make it the, the feature-packed site that, that you were talking about. Great, very good. So that concludes the open division presentations. We're going to take a short three minute break. Uh, so you have time to uh, take your headset off and uh, maybe grab a quick something to drink and come right back. We will return at 2.45 p.m. Uh, our time. We'll see you back in three minutes. Thank you. I'm going to start welcoming people back in. Uh, we could have some music going here and it would be me singing, which is not what you want. So um, if you can finish up uh, what you're doing and come back to the table, we're going to get started in just a minute. The pictures that you see rolling through are from the 2018 Assistive Tech Challenge. The first one, you might recognize John Doan as one of the award winners and um, he was from our, he's a judge this year. He was one of our award winners last year. And we have three of the four prize winners from the first challenge who will be participating in a panel discussion after we hear from the professional division teams uh, while the judges are off doing their judging. So we will start wrapping things up here for this break. We're gonna come back and um, here we go off to the next round of presentations. Now we are into the professional division. 
Um, first up in the professional division will be the team from Say Kid. And after that will be Braze Mobility. Just a reminder for the audience, we do have the People's Choice voting that's coming up after we've heard from the last of the professional teams. So just a reminder, the judges will be picking a winner from the first and second, first and second prize winners in both of the two divisions. You, the audience, get to pick the one winner of the People's Choice Award. So let's get started. Do we have the team from Say Kid ready to go? Yes. All right. Hi everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Delon with Say Kid. We help kids learn in a more accessible way by combining voice technology with tangible play. Next slide, please. A couple years ago, my son's favorite teacher left and was replaced by a new teacher who didn't have the tools or training to relate to him, which led to behavior reports and ultimately him being expelled from preschool. Next slide. Although every child learns differently, 100 million kids need extra support. Around 60% of these kids need some you know, skills and support related to cognitive skills. 22% uh, need support related to social emotional skills. And around 15 have some type of physical uh, impairment. The challenge is that a lot of the supports involve therapy or mechanical devices, which are both expensive and hard to scale. Next slide, please. Technology has to play a role, but if we're being honest, most, te most technology wasn't designed for these kids. In fact, excessive screen, screen time can actually harm their development. Kids don't build empathy by pushing buttons or self-control by staring at screens. These are all developed through back and forth interaction and by modeling behavior. So effectively, the most powerful technology isn't accessible to the kids that need it most. Next slide. Say Kids solves this problem. By combining voice technology with tangible play, we help kids learn in a safe, natural, and engaging way. Kids actually play the role of teacher. Next slide, please. Uh, so I can't show you, but believe it or not, uh, robots don't have empathy. So here a child is actually teaching the robot what it's like to be teased for being different. This not only helps her understand that there are differences, but also that those differences can be great things. Next slide, please. And here's another example of a child uh, practicing letter blends. So this can also be helpful for speech. Next slide. The thing that we've learned is that we can actually make almost all skills more accessible. And so we've mapped our experiences to early learning standards. Next slide, please. And in fact, here's a quote from uh, the person that actually developed the standard that's used by more kids in the United States. Next slide. Uh, so Marie and I are parents who understand how to help kids learn, but also how to do it in a practical, scalable way. Maria has taught kindergarten for 15 years, and I've led product and strategy roles for Google, Target, and uh, Deloitte. Target, I founded the Ability Awareness Network uh, to connect team members with uh, different abilities. Next slide. We've won a few awards. Uh, we recently won the Minnesota Cup Moonshot Prize for Biggest Breakthrough Innovation, and uh, Harvard named Say Kid one of the organizations with the greatest potential to transform early learning. Uh, last week, we actually won the Alexa to grand prize in the Alexa EdTech uh, Challenge as well. Next slide, please. So although nothing can replace uh, supportive adults, uh, I've also learned that even superheroes need help. So this is actually a picture of my son on the last day of pre-K with the superhero that was one of our first testers. Next slide. And if I could just close with, you know, our platform, our screenless play-based learning platform doesn't just make technology more accessible for kids with different abilities. It, it really makes technology more accessible for all kids. We really think it's time to put kids first. Thank you. All right. That's great. That's Say Kid. Judges, you can come forward. Let's have some questions for the team. Yeah, hi, this is Nathan. Um, where, what developmental stage are you at? What, what happens next? What, what do you actually have to do next with the, the development of the product? Yeah, we're in the process of scaling. So we, you know, we have partnerships. We work with some of the largest early childhood chains in the country. Um, and due to COVID, we've started to support consumers, which is a different use case. And so we've launched our largest pilot with consumers right now. We're trying to learn from that and make sure we get it right. Um, because this is pretty new and there's a lot that goes into it in terms of um, not just building it, but also helping adults learn how to use it. It's, it's very simple to use, but it still is a change. And so we want to make sure that we do that right. Got it. Thanks. I have a question. Um, have you thought about partnering with uh, other brands and using um, other characters to build your um, toy? Um, do you say other brands? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I got advice from some, so a lot of people have tried to do what we've done before and if they've all failed and I've talked with many of them. And one of the reasons they failed is they, um, one of them is they licensed because when you partner with a brand, it ultimately can turn into an entertainment company and we don't want to do that. Um, so the other thing is we want to make sure that it's always scalable. Um, so what we do best Lena is we make conversational software. 
Um, we use modular parts, so it's inexpensive. So I want to make sure that we're not uh, a toy company or a hardware company, that we're really a software company so we can scale. But we might look at we might look at different you know different form factors later, but it's just not our highest priority. One more question from the judges. Can I ask about traction. Um, can you share with us uh, how many units you have out there with testing now with uh, consumer uh, facing uh, use? Do you have, are you generating revenue and what's your pricing model? Uh, let me work backwards. So pricing model. Um, so we're testing a lot right now and the pricing model for consumers is different from schools, right? So, but uh, what we're thinking is basically a subscription model, but we also can sell the, the device. So basically two revenue streams. Um, we are, like I said, we're in our largest pilot right now with consumers. Um, and, you know, the schools that we're working with, um, you know, represent tens of thousands of, of families. And, uh, I can't say anything publicly, but we have partnerships with some of the organizations that you know have, have far greater reach. Very good. Thank you. That is Say Kid. Uh, we're going to roll into the next one. Next up is Braze Mobility, and on deck will be Quizm. So Braze Mobility, you have the comm. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pooja Vishwanathan, and I'd like to try a little experiment with all of you. So for those of you who are sitting in chairs right now, please try to look at the floor behind your chair while remaining seated. Okay, now I'd like you to imagine that you have vision loss or upper body mobility challenges that prevent you from seeing what's behind you. This is the reality for over a million power wheelchair scooter and users, scooter and wheelchair, power wheelchair users in the US alone. Next slide, please. According to a report, 20% of these users had experienced at least one major collision within the last year, and 11% of them had experienced, um, had, had been hospitalized. Next slide. Accidents like these result in property damage and can often result in the exclusion from power mobility device use altogether, even when no other alternative for independent mobility exists. I saw this as the violation of the fundamental human right to mobility and co-founded Braze Mobility. Next slide, please. Our products restore dignity and independence back to the driver, reduce caregiver burden and stress, decrease property damage, and increase safety not only for the driver, but others in the environment as well. So how do we do this? Next slide. You take a regular wheelchair, simply add on our patent pending blind spot sensor system, and boom, you end up with a smart chair that can automatically detect obstacles and provide multimodal feedback to the driver through intuitive lights, sounds, and vibrations. Next slide. Our product is low cost, starting around $2,000, highly customizable and adaptable to the user through our smartphone apps, and we've already established strategic partnerships and we're first to market. Next slide. I have a PhD in assistive technology and robotics and have been leading smart wheelchair research and international collaborations over the last decade. My co-founder, Dr. Alex Mihalides, is an internationally recognized leader in aging and technology. We have experience in manufacturing, accessibility, and business development and have end users on our team that help drive our innovation forward. Next slide. As of early this year, we've already been approved by the largest distributors in the US and Canada, giving us access to over 70% of combined market share. We have independent sales reps in over 30 states, and we've already been approached by global leaders in wheelchair manufacturing for an OEM agreement. Next slide. Our success stories include Phil Ratzlaff, who's resident in Minnesota, who has ALS and legal blindness, and David Watson, a long-term care resident with limited spatial awareness. Both of these users, for both of these users, our product have been game changers in that they've allowed these users to maintain their independence and mobility. Next slide. And we're not done yet. Soon we'll be piloting a new system that will automatically slow down and stop the chair for users who are unable to respond to prompts. We've already partnered with the world's largest wheelchair controller manufacturer in order to bring this technology to market. Our mission is to help millions of individuals all over the world to navigate boldly, independently, and safely. Next slide. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you, judges. Questions for Braze Mobility. I have one. Um, do you, could you talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned those two specific success stories, but how, in what communities and what types of mobility issues have you done testing or customer discovery with? 
Yeah, so we have over 100 customers already right now, and they, they range from people living at home like Phil, Phil Ratzlaff, as well as individuals like um, David Watson, who actually lives in a long-term care facility. The diagnoses also range uh, you know, from the couple of cases that I showed there to stroke, um, to cerebral palsy. So we have a lot of children with cerebral palsy. Um, and what we're generally finding is, you know, in terms of just keeping safety, not only is it allowing people who are already power wheelchair users to be safe, but one of the biggest success stories that we've had recently is that individuals who are otherwise would not qualify for power mobility because of problems like spatial neglect, uh, the therapists are now reconsidering and actually prescribing power wheelchairs as long as they're using it with our system. So we've really been a game changer there. Thanks. Do you anticipate selling this purely just to individual customers or are there institutional uh, customers that you think will, will be interested and be able to, to do this to a broader base? Yeah, so we do have institutions that are buying as well, but we find that they don't buy in huge volumes in the long term care facilities that have, you know, specifically received large investments in order to keep their residents safe. Um, we do see some long term care facilities who that might be resourced, but for the most part, our business model is through this, this to, through the dealer network. Um, so the, the top two dealers in the US that I mentioned there in SM and motion, they pretty much cover over 70% of the market share and that's that's who we're getting um, the the OEM agreement that I mentioned will help us, you know, really sell in large volumes because they'll be purchasing, um, you know, tens of thousands of units from us in the in the short term. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, one more quick question. Was there... Sure. I've seen that uh, there are some autonomous uh, technology companies that are moving into the wheelchair business. Um, how do you see this playing into that broader autonomous wheelchair world? Is this an incremental step? in that direction or do you think that your future is really fully autonomous? Yeah, so that's a really great question because my, my background and my PhD was actually in semi-autonomous and autonomous wheelchairs. Um, and one of the, the biggest challenges that we've seen and partly why uh, there have been some attempts at autonomous wheelchairs that have been massive failures uh, has been because of the lack of involvement on the clinical side. Um, so not involving clinical stakeholders and not actually understanding the reimbursement uh, challenges and the, the pathway has been a big, um, big limitation. And so with the partnerships that we've established, that's really going to be the way to bring out the autonomous wheelchairs into the market and and we're we're betting on ourselves to be the first to do that very good thank you that is braze mobility next up is quizm and uh then after quizm will be you belong and these are our final two teams of the competition today so quizm you have the stage thank you chris my name is Ahmed mccowey my teammates uh our founder greg smith and anthony kinanjui um, this is a rewards-based uh, educational platform for iOS and Android. Next slide. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted uh, kind of a gap in online learning and remote learning, um, especially as it relates to uh, the support for adaptive instruction for those with special needs. Next slide. Uh, Gabriel Amarku notes, we're all more connected than ever, but in special education, communication is still quite a challenge. Next slide. The reason being is communication uh, can become muddled amongst uh, many players um, at stake, including the special ed instructor, parents, guardians, and, and mentors. Uh, the progress sharing can, uh, can become difficult as well across several mediums. Next slide. Greg Smith came to me, a local Southeast Minnesota parent and business owner, um, with envisioning this idea. He said his uh, children were having trouble um, excelling in some areas and needed a way to connect uh, the teachers with him to identify where uh, his children were struggling and uh, kind of form that into a rewards-based app. That's where I came into the picture. Next slide. I helped identify uh, ways with which, uh, through an iOS application, we could control uh, a quiz that could be shared uh, between teachers and to the parent and then onto the student so everyone stays uh, engaged in the learning process. Um, that led to UX research with parents and teachers, uh, onto beta features being solidified, uh, similar to uh, publishers being able to publish their own quizzes, and that's part of the, the revenue stream. But these can be uh, parent-led and created as well. Uh, on to school and center engagement uh, with our marketing. Um, and just this week, a uh, soft beta launch with uh, iOS and Android with 19 contracts and counting uh, for our beta list sign up worldwide. Next slide. 
Why quiz them? Uh, it's easy to add students, uh, whether you're a parent or guardian or, a, uh, uh, or an institution. It's secure and it lets you reward your way. Next slide. Okay, parents and teacher creates a quiz, it's shared, assigned, and tracked easily, and you can add custom rewards. Everyone wins. Next slide. This reduces administrative burden, which can be 20 to 30% of a special educator's uh, time, increased parent involvement, and engaging the student with their, uh, with their work. Next slide. All right, uh, so winning this award for us would mean uh, being able to work with publishers, curriculum-based quizzes, uh, support our development and marketing costs, and continue UX research uh, efforts with educators. And that's where we're at today. Thank you. All right, very good. That is Quizm judges your questions for the team. I have one. Could you talk a little bit about how seamlessly this would integrate into existing curriculum for special education students? Um, like I understand the quiz component of it, but for other learning modalities, is, is there a way for that to play a role? Yeah, of course. Um, so we really wanted this to be both a uh, scalable and a repeatable process that would make it easier for uh, parents and teachers to, to use. So to that effort, uh, whether it's a publisher of a given curriculum creating these quizzes and uh, licensing them to teachers or the, the teachers um, or coaches, mentors uh, creating them as well and sharing them throughout their uh, school system, for example, would be one way that's done. Um, so we're really trying to, to give access to, to those folks in an easy way, repeatable. How do you control the quality of the content? That's really the fun part is um, it, it really, the, it's up to the, the publisher, um, him or herself. So um, whether it's a teacher creating content for just their classroom, uh, they're able to create those quizzes um, to, their, to their liking or a publisher that may have you know, a, a much higher standard um, in, in the types of things that they want to, uh, to license out. Um, as well as just a uh, perhaps a parent that wants to teach their uh, perhaps a special needs uh, child learn uh, emergency contact information, that sort of thing. All right. Thank you. That is Quizm. We will go on to our final presentation, our final professional team, You Belong. And just a heads up for everybody, when we're done with this presentation, we will be doing our People's Choice Award. So You Belong, you're here. All right. You have the stage. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm John Sioka, the founder of You Belong, the first social network for people with special needs. Next slide, please. At You Belong, we're on a mission to make the internet more inclusive for everyone. Next slide. This is my brother, Christian. He has Down syndrome, and I built Ubelong as a way for him to connect with friends after our family moved out of state, but in a way that was free from the threat of cyberbullying. Next slide. Cyberbullies can hide behind screens, but their actions have real consequences. And as a result, parents of children with special needs resort to keeping their child off of social media entirely. But this shouldn't have to be a solution. In the end, everyone, especially those with special needs, want to feel included when they go online. Next slide. With Ubelong, we provide everyone with a safe place to express themselves online. And one way we do this is with our proprietary algorithm, which allows us to detect and block cyber hate while it's being typed so that it never gets posted. Parents are finally comfortable allowing their child to be independent and go online, knowing that they're safe and welcomed on Ubelong. Next slide. And this is Ubelong. Ubelong is live on the App Store. Next slide. We set out to provide users with an experience that's similar to other social apps. Next slide all in a package that's simple and accessible by design. And we've worked with engineers from Apple and Microsoft to ensure that those who are low vision or blind can use Ubelong, and that's something we're extremely proud of. Next slide. There are 407,000 people with Down syndrome in the United States. There are another 53 million people with an intellectual disability. Globally, there are over 1 billion people who live with some sort of disability. With Ubelong, we're after an underserved market. Next slide. Most apps are free because they make money from ads. And we started with the same business model, but we quickly learned from our users that they didn't want ads. So we've since shifted our business model and will soon operate on a subscription basis of $1 per month. This means we don't need to display annoying ads and the subscription acts as a barrier to internet trolls who'd rather sign up elsewhere for free. Next slide. And as I mentioned earlier, Ubelong is live on the App Store with over 2,200 users from 26 different countries. 
and we've even been featured on the App Store. Next slide. I'm the founder of Ublong, and I've been developing apps for over eight years. My app My Voice was a 2018 Edison Innovation Award winner. I'm also a two-time Apple Worldwide Developers Conference Scholarship recipient, as well as a Microsoft AI for Accessibility grantee. And my brother Christian, he's our head of community. Next slide. The Ublong community provides us with unique insights into the problems that special needs families face every day. And one that comes up time and time again is how hard it is for parents to manage their child's finances. So seeing a huge opportunity, we recently announced Ublong Cash, checking and savings accounts for people with disabilities that focuses on financial literacy and independence. Our waitlist for cash has reached over 1,800 people, and we're excited to have Visa on board as our card issuing partner. We're also in active discussions with a sponsor bank, and are on track to bring Ublong Cash to market by 2021. Next slide. At Ublong, we're building technology for a more accessible world. Thank you. All right, great. That is Ublong. Judges, do you have questions for Ublong? So you mentioned that your one dollar, you know, entry uh, requirement, the subscription fee, is going to weed out trolls. How else do you do that? Because that's that's going to be a major, major issue. Sure. Yeah, so we use uh, what we call Ublong Protect, which is our algorithm that uh, essentially when you type, uh, we can pro provides us with sentiment analysis and puts a score on like uh, a message that you're typing, which means that you won't be able to actually hit the send button to post it. So we don't actually vet the person when they sign up because it's open to everyone, right? So I'm on there, uh, siblings, grandparents, parents, everyone's actually welcome to use Ublong. It's really the core of like what you post that's not allowed. John, really interested and intrigued by your uh, your you belong cash. Um, do you have someone on your team that understands uh, the kind of uh, the tech, you know, tech fi financing and and that whole industry? Uh, where where did you how did you land on that as a path to growth? Sure. So uh, I was an intern at a fintech company, so I have a little bit of a background in the, the finance space. Um, there's also the different uh, banking as a service uh, platforms that are out there that provide us with the different uh, APIs that we'll plug into it to actually bring it to life. Um, but I've been developing apps for eight years, so most of my background is in tech and stuff like that. Uh, so our goal to bring that um, to life is we have uh, pricing and contracts from these partners that will use the funding to actually move forward, uh, pay for it, and start bringing evil and cash to market. Going back to the core um, social networking platform, can you talk a little bit about how you will continue to nurture that space in the community as you scale? And, and what types of network effects you're hoping to yeah. create within this specific community? So uh, you belong as a social network is really great because it does provide us with those uh, real quick access to uh, our users who are able to provide us with like what we should build next. So that's why it's really great. But a lot of the growth has been organic because, you know, as a social network, um, people want to follow their friends. So they invite friends, uh, a lot of uh, schools, different groups like uh, Best Buddies, um, each in their local areas kind of create their own pages on Ublong. All right. Thank you. I suspect our judges had more questions for all of the teams and we had to cut it short. So thank you. Um, all right, so we are at a, a point now, we're at an inflection point. Um, the judges uh, are going to do a little Zoom two-step. Two they're going to step out of this Zoom session. They're gonna go and have some hard conversations about which teams they think uh, should be the award winners from the two divisions. And meanwhile, we are going to do two things here. We're gonna give them 20 minutes to go through that decision-making process. So thank you, judges. Uh, go judge. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to do the People's Choice Awards. So um, I'm going to ask Aaron to put up on the screen. These are all of the teams that presented in the order in which they presented. Teams one through 10. The first six were in the open division. The last four were in the professional division. Please vote for the team you think should be getting the People's Choice Award. There will be one winner. You get one vote. There will be one winner and we will announce the winner. Uh, at the end, uh, along with all of the other winners. So please uh, make your selections here. And uh, as soon as we're done with this voting, we are going to have a panel discussion led by um, Maddie Kennedy, who is from Minnie Inno, uh, from the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. So uh, 
will let them get prepared for their conversation as the votes are coming in. Um, please make your selections. There's $500 at stake for the, the People's Choice Award winners here. Looks like things are slowing down. You're gonna have about five seconds to make your vote if you're undecided, undecided. All right, we're done, thank you. We will, um, we will display the, the winning uh, team uh, at the end here. In the meantime, while the judges are off making their evaluations of the teams, I wanna take this opportunity to introduce Maddie Kennedy from uh, Mini Inno, which is a publication of the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. Uh, they cover tech and startups in Minnesota. Maddie writes The Beat, uh, Mini Inno's daily newsletter. She has been with the organization since its launch in 2017 and is passionate about covering Minnesota's ever evolving startup scene. I will turn the floor over to Maddie who is going to introduce our guests from the 2018 Assistive Tech Challenge. Maddie, you have the stage. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, first of all, amazing pitches from everyone. Teams, if you're still listening, very, very well done. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, as Chris mentioned, we are gonna be doing a short panel discussion with some previous winners of the challenge. So today I am joined by uh, Stan Allen, the Chief of Communications from Vital Aware Services. That was the first place um, winner in the professional division last time around as well as Sebastian Tavenas from Mobility for All, the second place winner uh, of the pro division. And also um, Samantha Grover from Cookable Kitchen, uh, the second place winner in the open division. Welcome everyone. Um, let's start things off by introduce yourselves a little bit more and tell us about what your company is building. Who's first? Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. Oh, um, um, Vitals Aware Services. We're the um, creators of the Vitals app. And um, um, we are, we've created technology that's already saving lives. It's exciting to, to say that. Um, we've created um, a couple of apps that, that um, first responders download. Um, that could be law enforcement or paramedics. Um, any first responder along with people who have um, invisible or visible disabilities and conditions, um, as well as their families or care providers or caregivers. And so our technology um, allows um, people to articulate what could help them when they're in the time of danger or if, they're, if they really need assistance, because when it's happening, they, don't, they can't do it at that time. So basically how it works is anytime someone who has our technology comes within 80 feet of a first responder, um, it, it alerts the first responder in real time and tells um, them how to help that person who's in need. Um, we've, we've expanded to schools, we've expanded to retail outlets, and um, that's where we are right now, though. As a company. Great. Sebastian, Samantha, someone else want to chip in? Yes. Uh, hello, I am Sebastian Tavna, the co-founder of Mobility for All. So our mission is to provide a safer, kinder, and personalized ride for seniors and people with disabilities. So think about Uber or Lyft with a higher level of care, service, and respect. We call it the family ride. And we are here to help people continue their normal life, going out and having a social life, which is improving their, their quality of life every day. Great, and Samantha? Hi, I'm Samantha Grover um, from Cookable Kitchen. We are an accessible recipe platform whose goal is to help uh, individuals, um, especially adults with cognitive and intellectual disabilities, cook and live more independently. Um, so right now we've got a, a web-based platform that we're working on um, and some you know, partnerships identified to um, develop some really thoughtful, um, at the core of our content is really thoughtful, you know, recipes that are catered towards meeting multiple learning modes, um, and then really displayed in a way that um, is step-by-step -step and allows people to bring us right into the kitchen um, and, and be able to gain a lot of independence through cooking. 
Awesome. Um, okay, I want to start with the basics. I know there are a lot of people here who have companies in assistive tech and even PhDs in the field, but maybe there are also some people here today that are just learning about assistive tech for the first time. So um, how would you define assistive tech and why do you think it's something the med tech community should pay attention to? Why don't um, we keep the same order or uh, yeah. anyone can speak of it if they like. Um, I probably I won't say a lot, but um, I, I feel like it's, it's services and resources that will improve the quality of life of, 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 of people. And so, you know, you can, that can come in different forms. Um, our, ours is, is, is using um, technologies and apps and Bluetooth technology, but it's about finding resources, using resources to, to really boost the lives, um, help people be able to function as normal as possible um, using different services. Um, so at Mobility for All, we, we started by uh, uh, developing an app to book your ride. And um, we found out very quickly during our pilot program that uh, um, the riders prefer to call us. They want to speak to someone. And so um, we did not have a lot of people using the app. And we found out that uh, uh, human interaction and the, the, the conversation and and, um, and it helped also to troubleshoot their rights to understand their needs and expectation and so we decided to create a call center uh, in order to to um, continue this personal relationship um, uh, and understand the customer's needs so we are going to uh, redevelop our app to make it uh, a little bit more friendly and um, available for everyone. Okay, great. Um, I guess I'll just jump in. I, you know, I second Stan's uh, comments, especially on assistive tech, you know, being loosely defined as something that improves quality of life or increases independence. Um, but in terms of why the medical community should pay attention, um, you know, it's not, it's not only a critical need. Um, we just don't, you know, the labor force in this area is so tight um, that we simply have to use technology in order to provide some of these services to people in order to, to um, improve the quality of life. But, you know, it's also leading to improved health outcomes. So for us, you know, we know that if people cook more that they will eat healthier and that leads, leads to better overall health. Um, and so if we can provide technology that helps them to do more cooking independently, you know, we know that their health outcomes are going to be better as a whole. And, you know, it's also, it's things like creating community and accessing those communities and things like that, that really just improve um, health as a whole. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Um, and now, do you think the industry has changed at all in recent years? I'll let you define the time period. And if so, how? Was there a change that needs to happen? What do you think on, about that? I'm back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, it, I can't go way back, but I, I do know that I, I think it's changed. I think it's changed in, 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 in a way, I'll say it this way. Um, there's cool technology out there, and we saw it today. And, you know, I think in the past, people would think of some critical needs that people had. It could be health-related. It could be something that is obvious to everybody, but when you, when you see people improving, you know, video games and when, you, when you're looking at things that, that, that are just innovative, I think that's how it's changed in my, in my, you know, in my point of view. Mm -hmm. It does yeah. in my point of view, yeah, it just seems to be expanding, which is very exciting. Yeah, for Mobility for All, I, I would say um, we definitely are, um, riding on the wave of Uber or Lyft. Uh, so it has changed a lot. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, um, uh, I, I think our, our population is not ready to use uh, uh, those services and they need a higher level of, of service and, and care. Uh, and so we are filling the gap. And uh, this market is a huge market. We, we have 10,000 baby boomers who are retiring every day and um, uh, they and they need, a lot of people needs more uh, transportation now than than few years ago. And I think we we see also that 
um, or, or customers are ready to, to try new things. But it takes time to try new things. You need to educate them. You need to make them feel comfortable by using a new service. And uh, it's part of the education, of the training. And uh, we cannot grow too fast. We need to, to take our time to explain why we, um, we are the family ride. Yeah, good point. Um, I guess my two cents, I am definitely not an expert on the industry as a whole, um, but I kind of tend to gauge these things a little bit by what um, I see going on with like the Department of Human Services and things that they're supporting and um, things that people are and aren't able to access through funding mechanisms like waivers and things like that. Um, so, you know, what I've seen from that is that they, you know, on a state level, I think there really is this recognition that we have to push more for assistive technologies to be supported. And they're beginning to have more funding flexibility to allow people to do that. Um, this, you know, very recent history, like our pandemic situation, I think has made that abundantly clear. Um, and I think you're really seeing all of a sudden, oh, we need to start um, supporting remote services. And what are the things that we can provide within that space? And, you know, all of a sudden people are really scrambling for these tools that would benefit people all along. So. You know, that's kind of been my huge silver lining in this pandemic is, you know, the things we've realized that I hope really stick and, you know, can kind of push some of this technology forward. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, Samantha, I, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, no, I want to jump on, on what Samantha just said, uh, because we were in that situation when um, the pandemic started. Uh, we are serving a lot of seniors. And when the pandemic started, we saw a decrease in ridership of uh, 60 to 70 percent. And so um, right away, uh, we, we saw that the needs were still here. People needed uh, grocery food and, and prescriptions. And uh, so we decided to, to switch a little bit of business and to provide uh, uh, delivery for uh, grocery and prescriptions. And we decided to help the community. We decided to offer those rides for free. So all the deliveries, the grocery deliveries for low income seniors uh, community in um, around the Twin Cities, uh, we decided to provide the entire service for free for, for them uh, in order to support that difficult moment and also to uh, participate in the community. Mm -hmm. Well, that sort of tees up nicely for my next question. Um, how has your business fared during the pandemic? And given what you've experienced, do you have any advice to pass on to other entrepreneurs? Um, is it my? Go for it. Um, I mean, just to be honest, it's been tough. I mean, it's been mm -hmm. very challenging. And, um, you know, we had great momentum going into COVID. Um, we were in the middle of a national expansion. Um, we had gained about 75 police departments in this state. And so we're in five different states, particularly California. And um, so it was, I mean, things were changing. We were really on the road all the time. Um, we ended up shifting though, shifting to, to make sure that we ended up creating a feature um, that would help people who are most success, successful to the COVID virus. If you have underlying um, issues and things like that, um, we, are, we are able to alert first responders um, if you have that. Um, but then we also offered the service for free um, um, for six months um, to law enforcement and, any, and, and individuals. But um, I mean, my, my advice is to kind of keep going. And, and we, we have some momentum now. Um, our um, president and CEO is Janae Harto. She's a former police chief in Minneapolis, and um, she's talking about policing and, and enhancing and policing. And we've really shifted gears to talk about that during this time. So we're just being nimble. And, and we're just, you know, if you keep thinking through some things, you'll think of a way to get out of it and get out of a problem. And that's what we've been doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of people's experience. That's what it's been. So I, I would like to add that uh, same thing than, than Stan, when we, uh, before the pandemic, we had a, a momentum and a growth of 40% uh, uh, months to months. And, um, and then everything slowed down. And I have to say, um, uh, not only we have a great team that understood that we need to uh, readapt, but we have a lot of flexibility. 
uh, and we decided to do things um, totally different on the spot because we are a small startup and because we are a, a small company, we have more freedom than others. We can des take decisions faster. And, uh, um, and we worked uh, together, it's easier to work together in a smaller team, but flexibility and, uh, um, and the ability to, uh, to understand and to listen to the customers really helped us uh, 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 go through that, uh, that uh, difficult time. Uh, we are seeing right now that the business is uh, uh, restarting, that uh, people need to, to go uh, out again. Uh, we have taken the, the right uh, precaution, of course, uh, uh, during the transportation where all the vehicles are disinfected, our drivers are, working, are wearing masks, uh, and, uh, um, and we ask, uh, of course, the passengers to, to wear masks. Uh, but we can see right now that we are uh, growing the business again in the last week, actually. It's very recent. That's awesome. Um, we're in a, a little bit of a different situation. You know, I, um, we pitched in the open division last year and our, stru our structure as a, an organization, I would say, is very fluid. Uh, we're, you know, we're pretty much volunteer run now. We don't have big sources of revenue. Um, and we've been kind of having that dance of, do we go private or um, more of a, a grant funded model for the last year, um, exploring those options. So, you know, in that sense, we had a, we've had a lot of flexibility in what we're doing in that, you know, our finances can't be impacted much because there's not a lot of finances to impact. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but that said, you know, we, we actually did have to kind of just we're taking a couple months off completely right now because our team that's working on it has been, you know, impacted in their day job so much due to the pandemic that, you know, it's people with small children at home, um, you know, other, other impacts on their jobs that are affecting their ability to work on it. We're pretty, we're in development and testing right now. So we have, um, you know, partnerships with, um, you know, the university and the, the uh, researcher out in Maryland and, um, Special Olympics and stuff like that. And these, our partners have been largely affected um, and they're really just kind of reeling from both financial impacts and just trying to adapt to what's going on. And, you know, it's, it's been really hard because that kind of means we can't, it's not a good time to make some of the asks that we need to ask of our partners. So we have kind of just made a decision to take a break for a little bit, you know, we recognize, we recognize that our people are our best assets, so we have to make sure people are taken care of or we're not going to have anyone to do the work, you know, when things settle down in a little bit here. So that's my advice is take care of people because you need them to do the work. So it's in your best. It's, yeah. That's a good one. Take care of your people physically, mentally, all that stuff. I've been seeing more and more companies putting emphasis on that. And I think it's Oh, more necessary than, uh, than people often think. Um, great. Well, uh, again, Samantha kind of touched on this, but everyone, let's go back down the line. Uh, tell us a little bit about how your business has changed since participating in the last Assistive Tech Challenge. Our company was a year, we were a year old, and so everything's changed. I mean, we were, we, we came to this challenge because, you know, we had never pitched before. And we thought it'd be a good experience to kind of really understand how to communicate about what we're doing and see what people would think. And it was, it's been great. Um, since then, we've, like I said, we've kind of started getting out of the state of Minnesota and we've begun our national expansion targeting um, Northern California. Um, and then we also went into some different, um, some different verticals, um, schools, and um, we had talks with retail outlets, destinations, and about four to five different states. Um, so, and, and then we also had a couple of new features. Um, we had focused primarily back then on, on B2B, and um, we really moved into aggressive B2C, especially during this time of COVID. We need to be able to speak to people directly and not, they don't have to have to have a law enforcement off, you know, officers involved. And so what we've done there is we've created a feature called Home Base that basically allows someone, if somebody's a wanderer, it could be somebody like somebody with autism or it could be somebody with dementia, they, they might just wander. This service, as, as soon as they leave the vicinity of the person about 80 feet, it's gonna alert the, the caregiver and help them find that person. 
And so that's a new feature since, since, since this time. And we're just trying to move on. We're just trying to keep moving and, and growing. Yeah, great. Yeah, for, for us, uh, um, November 2018, uh, we just had the pilot and um, John and I were drivers uh, <laughs> trying to figure out uh, what were the needs. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've done 100 rides uh, um, since then. Uh, and uh, uh, because of the Minnesota Cup, uh, because of uh, destination uh, uh, medical center because of other uh, competitions in the Twin Cities in, in Minnesota, which is a great place to start uh, a business, I have to say. Uh, we, um, we have raised uh, uh, more than half a million dollars. We have uh, uh, completed uh, uh, more than 5,000 rides, happy rides. I, I say happy rides because of or passengers who are uh, uh, enjoying the level of service. And uh, we are uh, on the path uh, to raise another million dollars to uh, develop uh, more uh, technology, by the way, and to improve uh, our, apps, our app and our systems in order to develop our service in different states uh, uh, outside of Minnesota. Awesome. Uh, I touched on it a little bit, but you know, we we were essentially a, a a pretty good idea with some interested parties before we pitched last fall, or you know, that fall to be perfectly honest. Um, so you know, big vote for the assistive tech challenge because I think what it really gave us is that vote of confidence you needed and a little bit of exposure to kind of gain some credibility, um, so that you know we could actually move forward and you know establish some partnerships. You know, we could go to people and say we won this competition. Um, look how cool we are. Don't you want to work with us? Um, and so, you know, we've been able to, you know, identify partners, um, several partners at the University of Minnesota, Special Olympics of Minnesota, um, a couple of folks from around the country, one of the leading authors on, uh, and researchers nationally um, on teaching cooking skills for adults with disabilities. So, you know, people really relevant in the field. So, um, you know, we've got a ways to go on particularly the financial and business side, but I think in terms of a plan and getting there, it's really just been a huge vote of confidence. And I'm, I'm not sure we would have, you know, really pushed out the door if it, if it weren't for the pitch. So kudos to all of you organizing. It's a, it's a really great thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's a wonderful platform for, uh, to learning, for learning about assistive tech, which sometimes doesn't reach every corner of the state or every, more specifically, I think every corner of the tech industry. And it's a very fascinating and ever evolving field. So I really enjoy following it personally. Um, well, let's see here. All right, so let's talk about the future. Um, it's a broad question. Feel free to take it in whatever direction you like. What are your hopes for the future of assistive tech? It could be with the industry as a whole or maybe your company specifically. Um. I was going to say, I don't know, are we having some difficulty? I heard something in the background there, but I think we're, I think we're okay now. Yeah, I was, I was going to, even before what happened this week, I was going to talk about equity and diversity. You know, I, I, as I've presented all over the state and region, you know, that, that's, a, that's an area that's lacking. We need, I mean, Vitals and other companies, we need to figure out how to reach um, communities of color. And, and the way they, that, 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 they, that they need to be reached, um, especially with this critical technology. You know, we don't want to increase the gap between the haves and the have nots. And so, you know, it's part of, it's, it's the future and it, it should be the present that we need to be doing everything we can to figure out how to get our technology in the hands of everybody that can use it. And, and that's hard to do, but you know, I think it has to happen. Definitely. So for, for Mobility for All, our, our immediate future is to develop a, a Rochester market <laughs> and uh, Southeast Minnesota. Um, so that's for this year. Uh, next year, we are planning to expand uh, um, in two new markets uh, uh, outside of Minnesota. And uh, uh, in the future, uh, the long-term future, we, we want to make uh, uh, Mobility for All the best place to work for. 
Great. And Samantha. Yeah, Stan, I love your comments too, because I had taken some notes before. We had the questions ahead of time and making the technologies accessible to as many people as possible was at the top of my list as well. There's so many great ideas out there already and even better ideas that are waiting to come to life that, you know, making sure that they are developed and distributed in a way that people can access is so important. Um, and along with that, I think, you know, I don't know exactly how to, um, you know, what it looks like, but I, one of the things we talk a lot about at Cookable Kitchen is how we can make our product more mainstream to kind of use an old term from, um, you know, special, uh, special education, meaning like, how do we normalize the use of these technologies so that um, it sort of increases awareness about human, human diversity and human difference among the broader population. So it's not just a conversation about a product for somebody with a disability. It's something that, you know, a whole lot of people can benefit from whether they have a disability or not, um, but also kind of increasing that awareness um, about difference and celebrating it. Wonderful. Well, I can't think of a better note to end it on. Thank you, all three of you, for a wonderful discussion. I'm getting a note from uh, headquarters over here that a decision has been made. <laughs> so I will turn it back over to Chris and you right. can tell us what's happening. Great. All right. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, panelists. That's been good. There has been a flurry of texts and emails flying around behind the scenes, but I see our judges have come back uh, to our room here. So uh, I think that means we've had a decision that uh, we have decisions that have been made. Patrick Sieb from the Destination Medical Center Economic Development Agency, a colleague of mine, was in the judge's room, and I think he wants to say a few words uh, on behalf of the judges before we make our announcements. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And on behalf of the judges, Dave, Lena, Nathan, John, and Jessica, I just want to say they had a spirited and engaging discussion about these incredible presentations. Um, they had the advantage of having some materials from each of the teams in advance, so they had a chance to review and come fully prepared for the pitches, and then the pitches themselves added additional insight and, and uh, information. And I will just say, uh, we used up every minute of time that you gave us. You did not give us enough time to uh, fully explore uh, the intricacies of these incredible submittals. Um, but with that, the, the um, team, um, the team of judges um, did come back with a consensus agreement around first and second place winners in both the open division and the professional division. And Chris, I will turn it back to you to open the envelope and uh, report on those results. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Judges, thank you. I know it was a, a hard task uh, in a very short window of time, and I know the teams made it really hard for you, So, I'm, which I'm really glad to hear. I don't have an actual envelope. I do have Aaron behind the scenes who's going to put up slides, and we will start in the open division. Second place winner is BMW Gate. So congratulations, BMW Gate. You are second place winner in the open division. And in the Open division, the first place winner is Recruitable IDD. So congratulations to those two teams. Uh, first place, second place winners in the open division. Um, that's great, we're proud of you, you did a great job. In the professional division, second place winner is Say Kid. Congratulations to Say Kid, you are a second place winner. And in the professional division, the first place winner is, drum roll please, Braze Mobility. Congratulations, Braze Mobility and Say Kid. That's great news. We're so pleased for you two teams. And then finally, drum roll please, the People's Choice Award is Braze Mobility. So um, this is great. We're so pleased. Uh, for all the teams, they did a great job. I know you made the, ju the, the job of the judges very difficult. Just a reminder, second place winners in both divisions take home $2,500. First place winners in each division take home $5,000 and the People's Choice Award is a $500 award as well. I wanna say one final thank you to all of our sponsors for their support on this event. 
I want to say one final thank you for all the teams for their great work. You were well prepared and you made the job of the judges very difficult. Thank you to the judges, our panelists. Thank you for everybody on the support team and the DMC team and Jamie and Collider and Cheryl behind the scenes. We look forward to seeing you all next year at the 2021 Assistive Tech Challenge. Thank you everybody and goodbye.